So this is episode four of Dear wow. Rachel and Soph. Yes, we've made it to four and it's the first episode in which we address some listener questions and I'm very happy about that. Rach, how are you? I'm good and I'm super excited that we got yeah, actually some questions. So that's very cool. But yes, I'm very I'm I'm good, but I'm very tired. I have had a very busy week um getting back from touring last week, mm-hmm. Perth Writers Festival on the weekend, and then just a whole load of bitsy little things. Good news, my middle son passed his driving test this week. I won't ask how many times because that's probably not appropriate on the air and he'd might. But it was I'm so happy because it means I'll have some free some evenings freed up from driving. Um, but speaking of driving today, I drove back from Albany where um, for anyone who doesn't know WA, um, Albany is about five hours south of Perth. Beautiful, right in the bottom of the bottom of the country. So it was a lot cooler than Perth, which was mm. nice. Um, and I did an event last night um, at Paperbark Books, which is a beautiful um, bookshop in Albany. So a bit tired today because drove back up. <laughs> but apart from that, I'm good. How about you? I'm very well, thank you. But before we go on to me, uh, so you drove five hours for an event one way Luckily, and then five hours back. So it's an event that was booked in like out, Paperback Books has been very supportive of me and a lot of WA writers for, you know, so, and they have a book club that they do once mm-hmm. a month um, and they chose my book for their February book. So sometimes they zoom in um, to people, but they love it. If Like we did it in a bar. It was beautiful. Like it's just really lovely atmosphere. Um so yeah, I'm lucky that I have my writing friend Anthea Hodgson, um, who is always up for a road trip. And she said, "Yeah, I'll come down with you." So we just went down. Um, she drove a lot yesterday. Actually, was good because for some reason I was very tired. So she drove. I napped. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it was it's a, it was a lovely place, but it is a long time. Like I wouldn't do I wouldn't do that necessarily, you know, all the time or for yeah. every bookshop. But because it was also in release month, you know, it's kind of you do a bit more sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah. And and when you said five hours south of Perth, um, even though I know exactly where Perth is, for some reason I'm always surprised that there's so much south of Perth. Yes. Like- yeah. And even though that's five hours south, you can go like then it goes sort of, I guess, yeah, east. And so it's like there's more of the, you know, there's even more further oh. south. But yeah. 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 Um, well, and so how many people were at the book club? Was it was it a success? Did you have fun? Think about 30 to 40 and then there's also got they've got 200 in their book club so they record it as well so that people who can't make it can watch it online so no it was a lovely lovely night um and it's so funny the WA I don't know if the rest of Australia is so small but uh, my friend Anthea was there and her teacher came from (laughs) so from years and years ago in the 70s so that was quite amusing. Um, but yeah, it was lovely. It was a very lovely evening. If you're ever in Albany, anyone listening ever goes to WA, you must check out Paperback Books. It's a beautiful, big bookshop. Um, and as well as all the latest books and all the back books, it's got good, gorgeous gifts and bags and cards. It's yeah, it's a gorgeous shop. And 200 people in their book club. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's not not bad for a, well, it's a small town, sort of. It's a small city. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've been to Wagga Wagga in New South Wales in the Riverina mm-hmm. region, but the Collins Bookshop there runs a book club as well. And, in fact, yep. I discovered a few years ago when I was there for the inaugural meeting of the Fair Valleys Book Club that Absolutely. the libraries, the Riverina Regional Libraries, actually run a lot of book clubs. And now this appears to be somewhat peculiar to this area in that library, it's not libraries everywhere that run so many yeah, book yeah. clubs. They had, you know, dozens of them. It was extraordinary. Wow. Like all the different types and, and stuff. I actually, yeah. speaking of the Fairbale Ladies Literary Club, no, book club, book. inaugural ladies, uh, inaugural meeting of the Fairbale Ladies. No, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> I just say Fairbale. That's what I do. Speaking of your first book, I saw it today in an op shop. Don't worry. Not in a, it was good. Like it's the old one and it was not, you know, so it was there amongst lots of big name, um, you know, international authors and stuff. And I thought that's where people seek out books sometimes and discover new authors and stuff so because I know as an author like sometimes it's 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 like oh there's a book in a secondhand bookshop it's like you know but I was actually there thinking I saw a lot of backlist books there and I grabbed a couple of other ones um and they're ones that you can't see hardly you don't get them in shelves you know in the shelves very easily so I think it's a great way to be discovered isn't it absolutely I completely agree it's like remainder shops or remainder sells a lot of um, people I think well I've said you know oh how awful to be in a remainder thing I'm like are you kidding like it's that's, better than being pulped it's better than being pulped and also 
we have to be conscious of the price points of books. Yeah. Not everyone can afford recommended retail price. Mm. Um, and not everyone actually is near a library, but they may be near a remainder shop. So I think, yeah, books have an ecosystem um, yeah. and they can find yeah. readers anywhere. Yeah. So I was excited to see your book. <laughs> oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you for noticing. Yeah. Uh, well, I am I'm still working on the copy edit of uh, The Art Hour at the Duchess Hotel, which is this year's book. And um, uh, not feeling despondent, which is good, but it's just that kind of slow, considered reading of it, which yeah. doesn't, doesn't move as quickly as I reading. Know, do you always think, I always think I'll be quicker at these sort of things than I end up being. So I yeah. allocate a lot less time than I, yeah. I actually end up needing. And I don't know why I'm so slow to learn that I actually take longer usually than I think I'm going to. <laughs> Maybe you're just an internal optimist about the amount of time it will take. Maybe I am. Maybe that's one way of putting it. When are the arcs going to be available for this book? Because I'm desperate to read it. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, well, it's going off to the proofs are going to be printed in April. So I guess like mid-May. I will definitely send you one, um, you. I, obviously. Uh, but I'm also just thinking of editorial processes because you would have overlapping. I do. Editorial. Yeah, just so you don't yeah. do that. So like yeah, that's a very interesting thing to actually ask about. Yeah, so you're doing the copy edits now. You Have you started next year's book? Writing. I'm actually not going to write one. Um, okay. I've decided it's a decision I made this week. Uh, oh, this week. Yeah, so. I know a few people who are actually taking a bit of time off. I'm now getting very, very jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it's 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 actually that that proof copy schedule is tricky because it lops yeah. a couple of months off um, the timeline and um, and I just felt like I didn't want to turn around so quickly because, as you know, making a world, creating characters, it's God. it's actually a big physical process in a lot of ways. And so it, I trusted what I was feeling, which was like I didn't think I had. You weren't ready or you were, yeah. Well, I think as I, I said. I will before, write things for fun. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Well, as I said before, and I know you've said it with your yoga and you're telling me off about my back, <laughs> like in some ways we really do, and I've said this is writing, you have to follow your gut and your like body mm. with how you feel about writing. I really believe that now. Hence why I took my longer for my last book. And, you know, although I've got, you know, deadlines and stuff, I'm very open to shifting according to how I feel now. I know that I have to listen to that because I've burnt out before without, you know, listening to it. So I really think that's very sensible. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and just just to clarify for the listeners, I wasn't telling you off about your back. I was telling you off because you're calling it a bad back. Yes, no, sorry. <laughs> I assume everyone's already listened to that episode. <laughs> it's so just, just as a little recap, if listeners, if you have a habit of saying I have tight hamstrings or I have a bad back, please don't talk about your body that way. It can hear you. So yeah. mind I your actually today used your, um, used this in... I was having a conversation in the car with my friend Anthea about her next book and how she's feeling about it. Hopefully she won't mind me mentioning this. And I said, I told her off sort of, <laughs> because I said, you are talking about your book as if it is bad and it's not even been written yet. Wow. And you're writing it off before, you know, and so I met, I used the analogy. And I think we do that same thing with our work sometimes. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, you know, that's silly Dotting, or it's, yeah. be, you know, it's not going to be meaningful or it's going to be, it's not going to work out. Or this is going to be my bad, my worst book I've written or whatever. And yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about it. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I just, uh, there are also a couple of writing projects I have in mind that I, I just would like to dabble in and yeah. not have a yeah. deadline on. So I, I, one of them I started last year, it's 25,000 words in. I quite like to go back to that. Another one's a completely different thing. So I just thought, no, I will take some time um to do that um and so yeah have you asked like your publisher obviously like they what were they um because I think people are often curious I hear people say oh are you on you know what happens if you don't you know if you're on a one book a year kind of thing yeah what happens if you don't do that like will your publisher get cranky so like what was your publisher's response a uh, fairly muted response um because I actually it's, it's very fresh yeah so, yeah um so so we're not announcing it here to them <laughs> No, no, they know, but um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I haven't had a chance to have a conversation. Let's put it that way; it's yeah. just been conveyed to them. But look, it is. It's as you know, and I'm, you do two books a year, and I just well, I, I don't know if I, I will. To... Like, I, I, that's the aim this year, but we'll see. Because I did it for a few years, um, and then I had to stop and pull back. Yeah, and there's a lot of other things on at the moment too, which I guess is probably one of the reasons why you've decided. You know, like there's other things you want to pursue or 
you know, yeah. different opportunities. So I don't know whether I will write two books this year. Um, I'm like leaving it open and just seeing how I go. Yeah. Because also if we look at the touring you've just done, for example, I mean, that's yeah. a chunk of time that's, that it's not just the time with the events and the travel, it actually takes you out of the rhythm of, yes, definitely. of writing and or editing. Like you have to, if you're writing two books a year, there is absolutely no way you cannot um have break be breaking that up well well maybe you can if you're quicker like so I know people who write no I don't I'm pretty sure if you write two books or more a year it's going to be very hard to write the whole book um in one go kind of mm. without having to stop to do either editing for the next book mm. or promotion for the last book so yeah it is you know it's not ideal in a lot of ways <laughs> did you just say if you're quicker as in uh, i think the implication was if if you're quicker than i am it's like two books a year right no, no, but i do know a number of people i think in the romance world right. like so so in commercial fiction you know one book a year is rather you know reasonably standard two book a year is rare um mm. you know every couple of years is okay you know <laughs> but um but uh yeah i in the romance world i know plenty of people some people who put out like 10 books a year and they oh. just I know it's insane I just had a visceral response to that I know I know it's insane um and but everyone's process is different everyone you know so yeah but I think some of those books are shorter than mine as well you know they're they're writing either category length books which are like 50,000 words mm. whereas mine I'm lucky if they're 100 <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah and it's also I guess uh different story arcs the, the romance story arc is somewhat set in the, yeah, exactly. the details it aren't but... idea. it doesn't make it easy but it does make it yeah it makes it you know what you're doing kind of thing you don't necessarily have to re, re, reinvent the wheel every time which I do think you have to do a little bit with general fiction yeah yeah and you also have to create a world and uh but yes. just the, the work on characters alone can take some time yeah, yeah. Even mm. subsidiary characters, sometimes I'll someone will pop up when I'm when I'm writing a scene and there'll be some character who pops up and I think, well, I don't know who you are. You. So I'm gonna stop yeah. and think about you. Yeah, yes, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> I just like to invade invade the stories I'm writing now. We should probably go on to this. Yes, we'll probably get to our questions. Um, okay. So we have we have actually two questions from two different people which are somewhat related. So we thought we'd address them together. together. So the first question is from Annie, and she said. I have had a hard time in my personal life lately and took some time off my manuscript to process everything. But the problem is now that I'm coming back to it, I often sit down to write and just can't feel anything. I try emotional music, setting a mood, rereading what I wrote before, et cetera, and it just feels like going through the motions. I would start a new story, but occasionally I sit back down and feel like I've struck gold and I'm dialed back into the characters. What do you both do when you aren't feeling it? Do you write through it or start again? any advice and then the related question from Kate Solly who is the author of Tuesday Evenings with the Coped and Craft Resistance which came out a year or so ago said do you have any quirky strategies to mix things up when you are feeling stuck do you go somewhere different to write switch to longhand use comic sans font wear a tiara these are some things we should try (laughs) (laughs) so um because you and I have talked about when you were writing Outback Secrets Mm. and you were stuck on that one and and you threw quite a lot of it out and started again yeah. um do you think though that, that was sort of a typical stuck situation or that was a result of burnout which could be a bit yeah different? I'm trying to work out is this a work is this a writer's block question or is because someone said to me a few years ago I don't know who it was I heard people someone talking about writer's block mm-hmm. that there's two types and I'm one I think Annie may have got have a type of writer's block Mm -hmm. and it's not that you um but then she's like she's not feeling it so that's why I'm like 100% but if 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 it is the writer's block thing I would say this person told me there's two types of writer's block one is actually just basic life you know what I mean sometimes there's things going on in our life whether it's um you know stuff with work outside stuff with aging parents stuff with kids stuff with health issues um you know marriage issues, whatever like there's so many things that can be going on sometimes we deal with multiple out- mm. things that are not to do with our writing and there's only so much you know mental energy we have and if your life is taking up too much of that is actually very hard to mm. be creative and to feel you know up to it so sometimes giving yourself permission to to not do it I guess and just to like you know writing I think we don't want it to be obviously it's hard we've talked about before if it's our job but either way like I don't want it to be a chore Mm -hmm. you aren't enjoying it why do it 
Yeah. Don't, you know what I mean? But at the same time, you can't just keep starting new manuscripts all the time, right? Yeah. Because if you want to get published or you want to continue to be published, you no one, you know, you need a full book. Yeah. Um, so I would say be kind to yourself in, mm-hmm. in that in that first any instance. Um, but also she mentioned I'd start something new. What did she say? She'd start something new, but no, she said, um, do you write through it or oh, yeah. start again? So I um, before I see what you have to say, I would say if she's into, if she's got another idea that she's excited about, mm-hmm. in this case, like because it's sort of related to life burnout, I think, and just being, you know, emotionally drained and, and that kind of stuff, I would say give yourself permission to play with the other idea. It doesn't mean you have to leave the, the new one. I think it's Allie Blake. She is a romance author. And I'm sure she says she often writes two books at once, not meaning like not consistently, I think she said, but if she's bored with one or she gets sick of one, she'll dip into the other where she's more excited about. So there's no one way of doing things. Obviously, yes, you do need to finish a book eventually, hopefully, but like don't hate yourself over it. And obviously there's already enough stuff going on in her life, in Annie's life. Yeah. Don't make right like you want writing to be the joy and the reprieve from that, not the so I would say you've mission not to write for a bit, read lots, watch movies, just enjoy yourself. And mm-hmm. if you feel like writing, do um it'll probably come back. Or if you have got that other idea you're excited about, I would say go for it. Mm-hmm. And maybe you get stuck in that, but then you'll be back to the other one. I don't know. What would you what do you think? Well, and before I move on to that, I just wanted to check because you you said that person said oh, there were two yeah. types of writer's block. Is yeah. this like the one block of of ideas? Yeah. So like um, the first one is just life. Sometimes, you know, yeah, our life is just not going to be conducive to writing. Um, and then we need to be kind to ourselves. And the other one, and I don't think that that's not exactly burnout. So I think burnout is different to writer's block, but it can mm-hmm. Um, like I'm not a psychiatrist or anything. Yeah, like that, I, feel like, block, yeah, yeah. I feel like it can. I can think it can give you that feeling, but it's really that you've just been pushing yourself too hard and you need to refill the well and you need to take a step back, take the pressure off. Like I think that's, so I think writer's block and burnout are two different things. And I think that the life, it's not necessarily burnout. It's just, there's too much going on. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean you're burned out from your words. It means that you're burnt out from, you know, you just don't have the mental capacity to, to yeah. cook to be into that sort of format I just even think maybe do something like knit so like do another creative project learn pottery um but the other burnout I mean the other writer's block is story block and I've definitely I would say I've suffered that um and I now know that is usually because so you get to a point in the story don't know what you know it's not working you're not feeling great it's usually because I'm forcing my characters to do something that's really actually out of, you know, it, it, the story, I'm forcing the story to go one way mm-hmm. and it's not really the right way for the story. That's what mm-hmm. I would say, those two types. So I, I, that's, yeah. Anyway, what did you, what do you have a thought? Well, I think that? it's also um, what meaning we attach to the word block when we're thinking mm-hmm. it. It's like, because you can start to, to raise the stakes of it, you know, there's, so there's the, and I'm sure you felt this when you were working on a manuscript or redrafting a manuscript in particular where you feel like you're in a scene or a chapter and it's just like, oh, I don't really know what to do here. Now, I could turn that into a drama. I could think, yeah. oh, my God, I'm completely blocked. Instead, I just think, oh, well, I just need to stop now. Yeah. Or um, or I think, oh, well, I need to stop now and also consider whether I'm on the right track yeah. here. So I do need to leave it in order to work that out. I don't ever lose my nerve though. I don't ever think, oh, I'm blocked and I'm not going to be able to sort this out. That's and when I've, yeah, when I've had the redrafting blues and just thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not going, ah, I can't work this out. I don't understand these notes from the editor, whatever it is. Um, yeah. I do remind myself to hold my nerve. So I just think, no, no, you can do this. You have written the manuscript in the first place. Don't lose your nerve. Just hold it. Come back to it when you need to. Sorry. That's that self-talk again. And I think, yeah, yeah it's, and I'm similar in a way like now. I think I said maybe last week or the week before, I hate to say this because it feels like I'm touching, you know, or tempting fate, but I do think that I can fix almost anything now as well. Like, and I know I have that every book I think, oh my gosh, I'm, I am I don't know how to do this. It's just stupid. And I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, like, and, and then I often, I think when I get to that point, I do need to take a step back. But there's that, there's that whole difference. Like you can't just always go, 
oh, I'm not feeling it today. So I'll just right. go because we've got to get through it. Walk or, I'll, or I'll cook or I'll just have a nap or read a book. You can't always do that or it's never going to get done. So I think it's really, it's that whole being aware of your mind, body and everything and knowing, mm. am I just feeling lazy? And I really would like, <laughs> or am I really needing a break? And sometimes, you know, getting the words down is not the be all and end all. Sometimes you do need to think and just like let your brain sort of wander. But it's you have to work that out which one you're in, don't you think? Yeah, and maybe that's a function of experience. And I guess for me also, um, I tend to think if, if it's a if it's a story block, or even actually what Annie's talking about that idea of she's not feeling it, um, or maybe that's it's actually particularly for that sort of experience if you think of of creative creativity and creative flow as being like a river the river is always flowing now you can step out or step into the river this is a drought uh, <laughs> are you gonna be literal about it rachel uh, <laughs> but it's that idea that, that that if you the tap can turn on and turn off i guess and we can turn the tap on and tap off and stuff sometimes we need to yeah. but if you do think of, of creative flow as being like a river Sometimes you will need to step out so it doesn't carry you along. Sometimes it's not safe to be in there, um, but the river is always there. And I firmly believe that. And I never, never would have believed it not even that long ago. Yeah, yeah. Now I just think it's everywhere. Like seriously, creative flow is everywhere around us. We can all step into it. You just got to feel like it's the right time. And I guess what Annie, what Annie's doing right is trusting her feelings. Yeah. So do you think maybe she should give herself a break or play with what's your advice? I'd like an idea of play, like the word you use playing with an idea, that's really important because that's that's introducing fun yeah. into it rather than toil. And so that when you're and in a situation. You don't, want a guilt, you don't want the guilt, like, oh, I have to yeah, write. That's right. So whenever there's guilt or toil attached to the, to it, um, of like, I should do this. I, I, you know, I've come this far. I need to do this. It's like, what do you need to do to bring the fun back? Maybe it's a different idea. Maybe it's just reframing your perception on the idea you're working on. So instead of thinking, I have to, it's like, maybe I do like this writing caper. Maybe it could yeah. be fun if I stop attaching so much um, importance to it. But only she knows with her. Project. I think also, I said that I know even before I was published. It took a long time, as we probably discussed. Um, and I actually got to the point where I was thinking, like, oh, it's Sunday afternoon. I should be writing because I want to do this, or I want to publish a book. I should, I better write. Whereas what I really wanted to do is like watch a movie or, you know, just kick back and relax or, or whatever, or go out with some friends, you know. But I was, I'd put this guilt on myself because I thought I need to be published. I want to be published. Mm -hmm. And so I, what I did with my very last. Well, the first, the last book I wrote before being published, which is Jilted, mm -hmm. and that did get published. I realized just before that that I was getting to the stage where it was like, I am writing, I'm continuing to write because I think I should, because I've told everyone I'm going to be a writer and I, I, this is what my dream and I want to do this. But it had got to the point where I was really, I'd lost the love, I'd lost the passion kind of thing. And it was like, I got rejected many times and I was just starting to think, what am, what am I doing this for? Like, what's the point? Like, I don't have to do this. <laughs> um, and so what I did with that, and it, it was hard in a way, but it was also easy. It's hard to, is I said, I'm going to write one, I'm going to write a book. It's my last stitch attempt. And I'm not saying Annie should say it's the last stitch attempt or anything, but I'm just saying the mindset. Mm. I'm going to write a book and I'm not going to think about publication. I'm not going to think about who might read this because I think it's very hard if you want to be a, um, and I don't know whether Annie is talking about, you know, a book published or she's mm. she's published or, you know, aspiring or whatever, but it's 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 hard to sort of shift the mindset of I want to be published or I want this book people to read, you know what I mean? Mm. But it's I think the best way sometimes, and it, we should have probably even do it too, like we can, is to forget about all that. Yeah. Right? And just try and write the book because you want to and you want to have fun, you like stories. So yeah, I think you're right. Fun, play. Um, if you're not enjoying it, maybe try another idea. Just stop for a while. You know, no one's, you know, mostly no one's holding a gun to our head saying, if you don't write this book, something's gonna, yeah. something terrible is going to happen. And in terms of like just a technique to to liberate oneself and have fun, and I'm, I'm being completely serious when I say this, I really recommend dancing. Yeah, man, just putting on because this is something that's actually so intrinsic to humans, and we and we don't do it in our culture, at least. 
the yeah. way our ancestors used to embrace it. Um, so I could go on an extended riff about this, but long story short, um, humans used to take everything to the collective dance. They would they would take grief, oh. they would take joy, celebration, troubles, and and in the collective dance, you were not alone. Um, and then that, yeah. in the Middle Ages, in certain cultures, the, that's that was banned basically there was organized dance and uh, it was far easier to control people who were individuals not in a collective oh, Let's wow. that way. so and, and and with that we saw the rise of depression and anxiety there's a book called dancing in the streets by barbara ehrenreich which goes into this in quite Gosh, a bit of detail. put that in the show notes <laughs> yeah but it's in the but yeah. it was it's revelatory and, and i come to this from my yoga teacher shiva ray who is a proponent yeah freeform dance and I've learned this through her and I've also learned how much dancing actually unlocked my creative flow essentially so there were other practices I did with Shiva that helped but really it was the, it was the dancing and the idea of of just letting go of structure around it that doesn't mean there aren't structures that you learn to go into it but that that permission to just respond to the music and to be in it which we have absolutely lost yeah. we live in in Australia um the broader culture that is and uh it's really useful you put on whatever music you want to dance to I'm a big fan of stomping it out like if you have a, a downbeat that actually will help you stomp stuff out yeah yeah ground it into the earth and actually get it out of your body I love uh, that yes. uh, Annie you need to try that and and also I was just yeah. wondering I was thinking it would be great to know um obviously no pressure Annie but if you do try any of these things or whatever, let us know further down the track how yeah. you went and what worked. Dance it out. I, it's yeah. so it's also just about finding it's finding songs you want to dance to. I think a, a, a big strong downbeat's a good one. Um, I could probably put some songs in the show notes. Actually, yeah, that's a good but, idea. Do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, some they're not songs so much as they're they're pieces of music. But so last year, for example. Well, not even for example, last year, my teacher was out from the United States. There was a weekend in Brunswick Heads in northern New South Wales. It was a two day uh, workshop thing. So we literally danced through the streets of Brunswick Heads. Oh, we had cool. silent disco headphones on. And I've been working with her long enough that that I'm past the point of being self-conscious. At I all. saw people doing that in Northbridge not too long ago. That's a Perth, part of the Perth city. There you go. So it's spreading. Um, but it's just being out in public, dancing on streets, it's, I am not at all self-conscious about that. Now, a few years ago I would have been, but just yeah. through through practicing really? with I'm not. But it's it's really freeing. And so it's that idea of, and where it's related to writing, it's that idea of not worrying about what people are going to think of what you're yeah. writing. So as you were saying, just you know, re release the shoulds, release the idea that's going to get published just write because you want to be in that moment with whatever's going on on the page and hopefully you feel that stepping into the river and letting the flow yeah. take you along. Same way you might feel when you're dancing. And I, and I, I think that to dance is to connect with that. So it's like yeah. what is that feeling when you're doing that? Try to, if, if you're like not feeling that while you're writing, then give it find, up. Find, yeah, give it up or find do something else. Like I love the dancing idea, but, yeah, anything creative as well. Like I think yeah. that's not necessarily – um you know try drawing try sewing try baking. Said, yes absolutely like craft is fabulous yeah. uh yeah. cooking is a creative act or baking in particular yeah. or decorating cakes so it... don't put the pressure on yourself I would say and just yeah try and have fun <laughs> for a bit yeah I'm fun it's advice as well to um like whether you're a spying author or you're a published author like to try and switch off the voices that mm. don't matter like you know <laughs> anymore yeah yeah, it's it, it. Look, it is so hard to not worry about what other people think, and and I and I do credit Dancing with Shiva as a big factor in not worrying. Yeah, no, I can understand. Like, yeah, that would. Yeah, yeah. it's because it's just when you when you're literally dancing down the street of a town with silent disco headphones on, and your arms and legs are going everywhere. If you let the sense of voices in your head stop you, the joy you is conscious and. Well, to be honest, like I actually am a self-conscious dancer. So, you know, like if I, if say I ever go every year to the Romance Ride Australia conference and there's always at the end of our awards night, you know, there's the dancing and stuff and I always feel really self-conscious and that, you know, that's not necessarily, yeah, said like, I don't know why, because it's like no one's. Because it's the culture we've been raised in. I mean, yeah. we've actually been programmed to feel like that because 
of the interpretations that are put on dancing, but dancing is something that humans have been doing for millennia. Mm. And uh, so this is this is my obviously my little agenda here is to get everyone dancing. But dancing. I, just think I love it. Embodied joy. I think what it's about is embodied joy, and when and not worrying about what other people are thinking necessarily too. Yeah, yeah. But that embodied joy that you probably have when you're in the flow of writing, the same way I do those moments when you're writing something and then you reach the end of the chapter or whatever it is and think what time is it (laughs) yeah yeah I guess the other thing though is it's not all you're not writing is not always going to be that joy is it so it is that balance between you know it shouldn't you it shouldn't be horrible all the time but sometimes it's gonna be harder than others so yeah there's a whole it's not easy (laughs) like working out all these things what was the Kate's as her, have we answered Annie's? What was I think, Kate's? Yeah, well, I think Kate's was related. She just said, do you have any quirky strategies to mix things up when you were feeling stuck? Well, I think we've just addressed them. I love your dancing thing. Yeah, I will definitely like, it's it, mine's basic stuff, like walking the dog as well. Like yeah. I just find, and I think we, everyone's talked about this before, but having a shower seems to. Oh, really? No, I yeah, don't know about that. Always. One. Yeah, water Um, really usually, like it helps me like not not specifically necessarily if I'm feeling stuck I don't go oh, I'm going to go and have a shower but often if I've been kind of in the writing zone or whatever um or yeah like I'm thinking about the book and then I have a shower things will ha- like my mind will there's something about the water that just makes things clear or like either I can solve a problem that I have been thinking about or I have some dialogue so often and I heard Hannah Rachel say this on a podcast as well so often I will like get out the shower and it'll be my towel like rushing through the house to my office to like write a few notes down or whatever right. so I think those sort of things I haven't worn a tiara um I so nothing nothing really ritualistic mm-hmm. I think but yeah I think you're right we have sort of answered that I think just doing something else and um taking that pressure off and being kind to yourself is the best way Well, you talking about the shower reminds me of something I read a while ago um, in the, there was a piece in the Guardian about the novels of Jilly Cooper. Now I'm a fan of Jilly Cooper and it said there's no problem in a Jilly Cooper novel that can't be solved by washing one's hair or opening a bottle of champagne. And I realized, oh my God, that happens so often in her novels that someone's washing their hair or opening champagne. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, I think that's the same in life. I reckon she's right. There's no problem that can't be solved by washing your hair or opening a bottle of champagne. That is a great quote. I need to remember that. But it's like there you are saying, you know, taking a shower. I'm thinking, wow, Jilly was onto something. She is. So I need to write that later. No, write that down on my wall. I've got it on my wall in my office. I've got a whole load of quotes, like um, from podcasts I've listened to, things like that from authors who have, you know, so that that's going on my wall. <laughs> but if anyone has not read the novels of Jilly Cooper, they are fun. Yes, yes, exactly. And I bet she had fun writing them, right? Most of well, the time. and still having fun. I think there was yeah. just one out last year. Yeah, to, um, Tackle. Have you read that? <laughs> so they, like one of them's jump with an exclamation mark. Oh, the titles are just gold. I know. I think she's a friend of Queen Camilla, Jilly Cooper. I think she is too. And Charles. Yeah. So there you go. Look, it's. She's got all the contact. Um, um, they're fabulous. They're often um, quite long, the Jilly Coopers. You yeah, yeah. Connect. Yeah, I think that or that whole all the bonk busters of the you know eighties and stuff were quite long. Like, uh, yeah, bonk busters sort of fell by the wayside. I was a big fan of the Judith Krantz novel. Yeah, yeah. For a long time, I think I was uh, very much too young to read some Judith Krantz's when I came across them. But um, my mother always had a policy of just letting me go for it. And yeah, uh, yeah, I like that. See what happens. Well, you've written a book club book. I've got a book club title on my wall. That so um, I've got a whole load of things over there of titles that I'd like to write and books I like. One's called the Bonk Buster Book Club. <laughs> Rachel, now you've announced that you've got to do something with it. I know. <laughs> Alliteration is gold. Yes. It's, well, see, now you've also revealed something about your writing practice. You keep titles on the wall. I do. I've got a few up there, things that I do want to write. Um, yeah, I love titles. Titles, if I, yeah, they really inspire me. <laughs> so they're on the, are they on the wall um, so that they, they, if they catch your eye and you're thinking about one, it's like, okay, I've got to do something. So I've that. pretty much, there's a couple I'd take off. So um, I've just got, yeah, it's a little whiteboard over there and I've got, ones that I want to write so I definitely know the titles so there's yeah there's a few that need to go off there at the moment because they're either I've either thought no that's not you know what's going to happen or Bridget Jones is at the top the other Bridget Jones so that's going to go off because I've yeah. done that one yeah um, 
And so, yeah, I've just got those are books that I'd like to write. Mm. How many are there, just out of curiosity? I'm just thinking because I've got, so one says the last day of your life. Oh, no, don't, don't. Give oh, them, just no, no, okay. This is like top secret information. This is why I'm not asking you to turn the, the computer. Yeah, no, but I'm just telling you that that one is now changed its name. So there's two, just two titles there. Okay. So, um, well, including Bridget Jones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. That's but like, they're very much, they're not, some of them are more thought out in my head. Like I've got, you know, actual thought things I would like to write about and others are like the bonk buster book club is literally the title basically yeah um when they're thought out in your head do you keep notes at that stage or do you have a process whereby if it's in your head and and it's developing in your head and staying with you that it's actually going to turn into something I've got some of those I have got a few notes on um one of them I had to write a semi uh like one of them I've written a semi-synopsis for, even though I never, I'm pretty bad at that. And I don't usually do that with my publishers and stuff, but it was to get a, a contract, another contract. Um, Like I've, I've signed, I signed a two book deal with Penguin and um, that was going to be women's fiction and a romance novel. Right. But then I had an idea for another sort of romance novel to go. So we've made the first contract is basically two rom-cons. Um, but um, my publisher knew I had another idea for women's fiction and so she's like can you write so I, I've got notes a little bit on that it'll probably change a lot so yes nothing on the Bonk Buster Book Club there's other ones there that have got a little bit of notes in you know various notebooks and stuff I'm not organized at all though so like I, I then go okay I'm gonna start writing this book and I know I wrote notes somewhere I know I wrote a few <laughs> things Where did I put them was it on the computer was it in this but I actually do have a notebook I don't know if you keep do you keep ideas like how do you I do keep not in a physical notebook um I do have a I actually started using Trello I don't use I it that Trello. Much, but I, I keep it. I use it for for book ideas I actually have a book idea one on Trello too like um <laughs> I've got on Trello one that says uh it's a manuscript to book and I've actually got so now that that whiteboard over there is quite old in terms of I haven't updated it for a while but on Trello I've got a lot more sort of titles and some of them have more information than than others there but I do also have this little notebook on my desk in my office that has just random, you know, stuff in here. Like some is like a, a title would be good. Some is a, like an idea I'd like to, you know, mm-hmm. write. About. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's very random. Um, I remind, I'm just, I'm glad I reminded that remember that it was here because I need the book I'm currently about to start kind of writing. I'm like, I need more. And the, the main male character needs some sort of issue. So now I'm going to have a look in this when we finish. Yeah. Do you sometimes look at the notes, whether it's on Trello or in that book, and think, really? Did I write? I have no I memory that. of writing them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely sometimes, which is why I think it is good to write things down, isn't it? Well, mm, I'm very yeah. careful. <laughs> um, it's a bit like dreams, you know, and other things I look at and I think, well, why was I thinking that that was a good idea? Like that is just not all that that's been <laughs> done just, for yeah. by other people. You know, why would I even put that there? And then there's some random things that I'm like, would I ever even write about that? Like, it's, But I've just, yeah. But it's so, come from somewhere. This is part of what's fascinating about the creative process, I think, is that these things kind of infiltrate from some plane of something and obviously and, tap you on the head at a certain point and then you note it down and then it's it's moved on the river's moved on yeah and we'll come back have and you, go have you read elizabeth gilbert's big magic i haven't but i've heard her talking about it so that whole idea of ideas being in the ether i, I love it so much. absolutely true that if you hey. something comes to you you've got to pluck it and do something with it or release it for someone it does, else yeah it does go otherwise like I've had um a few times where you know and I've got have you got any ideas there's a couple of things I've got where I'm like I, I can't write them yet because I haven't it's not quite there or I've got other things I have to write but I'm like scared that someone else is gonna write it and all that not and not not because I'm scared that you know like there's so many books with stories are you know there's there's no new ones right yeah absolutely yeah but it's more, it's more that, yeah, I'm scared that the idea will, will leave me and I will no longer be, you know, and I think this, that's, that happens. Like there's some things that I know I've been wanting to write about for years. and I don't actually think I ever will. Like it's. Yeah. And it's, and the other part of that though, is maybe those ideas will seed into stories you do write. So maybe yes. that maybe they exist actually to give you something, even if it's just a little figment a of something. bit of it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So now the Bombbuster Book Club's out there. I'm going to be thinking about that you're going to have to write it. Like, I, I am hoping to write it. I need to go back because I, I haven't actually read many Bombbusters because I was I was born in 1981. So by the time, you know, like it was, no, 1980. Golly, I'm They're my favourite books to pull out of the office. myself younger. <laughs> um, I've got loads because I've been collecting them ever since that, um, you know, mm-hmm. that title came into my head. And I've heard people doing research on Bombbusters and, you know, talk. So, yeah, but I, it's not quite there yet. So yeah. this, yeah, I don't know if Olivia Goldsmith classifies as a bonkbuster author, but man, her books were big. Yeah. And okay, they were at that time. Um, one of hers I've got is called Insiders, and it's about pri- women in prison. And I haven't actually read it yet, but I picked that up in an op shop, um, you know, years There's ago. One called, I think it's called Bestseller. I do have it, but it's been a long time since I've read it. Yeah, quite hard to find, but yeah. it's. It's fascinating, especially when you know something about the publishing industry. Yeah. And again, it's it's a very thick tome. I know. And that's the thing, like, how long are your books usually? Uh, about 110,000 words. And so, yeah, so page-wise, like 430s. Yeah. Mine are probably around 110 to 130,000, probably leaning towards. And and I would I keep trying to write shorter because, <laughs> because especially overseas and stuff, you know, I've been – when I've had feedback and stuff, um, it's been, you know, we want 80,000, 100,000 words max. Um, and I just don't seem to be able to write. And I'm like, but, yeah, so I feel like these days, are we seeing it like with, like, books on TikTok and stuff and some of the self-published books that have gone then to trad books, mm-hmm. they are quite big and thick. The Emily Rat, like, pucking around is yeah, huge pages or something. Yeah. Um, so I feel like we're going through you know, stages, but I always get told I write too long. There's always inevitably a couple of reviews that say, there's stuff in here that couldn't have, didn't need to be there. And oh, well, you but, you know, one of my favourite authors is Marianne Keys. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very lucky that I'm reading her new book that's coming out in April at the moment. Mm-hmm. And they're long books. They're long books. But I don't, and stuff in there, you know, you definitely don't need. But I like it because, as you said, we're building. We were talking about building a world before. You know, you're building yeah. a world with characters. I feel like I'm part of their world, and I'm interested. Like, I mean, most writers and readers, we're like curious about people. We like overhearing conversations, and yeah. And also, so, I think there's a the, there's a difference between readers wanting long books, and then perhaps industry publishing. not. So, my mother is a voracious reader. She's an eclectic reader. She will often choose a book based on how long it is. She <laughs> wants a longer <laughs> book. Once a longer one. I don't yeah. Yeah, I don't blame it because you know what? I feel ripped off sometimes when I because if you write a hundred and thirty thousand word book or you write an eighty thousand word book, the readers are paying the same amount, right? Like it's just and so and I've seen the books creeping even a little bit shorter than that lately. And it's like I don't want to pay you want um, value for money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a you're a former bookseller, as am I, and, and yeah, that's, that's a real thing for a lot of people. And they're very thin books. It's like, I mean, there's some literary authors who do are doing very well with some very small, like, you know, basically just not much longer than short stories. And like, is it Claire Keegan? Have you read any of hers? I haven't, no. I don't know how, like, <laughs> I read one. I enjoyed it. It was all right. But it cost me a lot to buy this tiny little book. Um, but, yeah, it's a different kind of, I think it's a different market than they are. Uh, yeah course. it's it is but but I but I also like a long book because I think if I'm in it and I'm enjoying it then yes, I, do, it. <laughs> I do want as much as I want yeah it's it's why end it too quickly That's yeah I don't know but then the opposite if it's, a, if it's a really too long book it daunts me especially if it's in a series because I'm like I don't have time for that so it's it's, it's gonna be a perfect spot <laughs> well and and back to Jilly Cooper there was a period there apparently where she didn't want to be edited and you can actually see that in the books from that time not well they are very very long even though her books are usually long these ones are longer even and also storylines sort of start quite late there are some storylines yeah. introduced later on that if she had had an editor uh probably would have Either come out or been changed. That successful, or that you know, selling that many books that you could literally say, "I refuse to be edited." I don't want to be edited anymore. You have to publish my books as is. <laughs> like, imagine that. I can't even. Yeah. I think we can appreciate the impulse just to avoid the tears, if nothing else. That's true. You know, it might be less stressful. Because <laughs> <So. laughs> it is, yeah, as previously discussed, it's a physical process. Sometimes Panadol's involved. Yeah. Yet we put ourselves through it over and over again. 
Yeah, I know. We're. I think we are crazy. That's the only explanation. <laughs> Look, that is a great note on which to end. Um, especially because at the time we're talking, uh, you have to to go to another commitment. So, um, on the the note that we are crazy, I will wrap it up. <laughs> we will wrap it up. <laughs> And I think we have another listener question for next time. So we'll get to that then. But if you are listening to this and you are a writer or a reader who has a question, please uh, email us on the email address that will be in the show notes. And we look forward to receiving it. Bye, Soph. Bye, Rach. (laughs) See you next time.